Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Don Taylor, and I'm a professor and labor educator at the University of Wisconsin School for Workers. Uh, and I'm a member of the Havens Wright Center Steering Committee. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's visiting scholar. Uh, Tony Gilpin is a labor historian, writer, and activist who holds a PhD in American history from Yale University. She's a co-author of the book On Strike for Respect, the Clerical and Technical Workers Strike at Yale University. Uh, her writing has been published in Jacobin, Labor Notes, and In These Times, and she was the recipient of the 2018 Deborah Bernhard Award for Labor Journalism. Her new book is titled The Long Deep Grudge, a story of big capital, radical labor, and class war in the American heartland. The, the book is an account of the militant, radical Farm Equipment Workers Union and its decades long battle with International Harvester Corporation. It's also the story of how during a time when labor management cooperation was gaining ground as common sense in the US labor movement, FE, as one reviewer has said, embodied the ideology and practice of class struggle unionism more perfectly than any other American union. The FE vision included a commitment to multiracial On, you're muted. <laughs> Was I muted the whole time? No, no, just for the last, you know, 30 seconds. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. My, my notes went behind the screen and I went muted at the same time. So I don't know what happened. Um, well, if I didn't say it, I want to, well, if, I, if you missed it, I want to at least say the part where one reviewer said that FE embodied the ideology and practice of class struggle unionism more perfectly than any other American union. Um, the FE vision included a commitment to multiracial anti-racist organizing in the South, work that the union took beyond the plant gates and into the community. Uh, to tell us more about that vision, Tony's talk today is called, We're Not Going to Be Second Class Citizens in the South, the Radical Interracial Organizing Model of the Farm Equipment Workers in Louisville, Kentucky. So with that, I'm pleased to present Tony Gilpin. Thanks very much, Don. And I just want to make sure everybody's getting the audio okay, because I know somebody put in the chat that they were having audio trouble. So speak up if you are, but I'm assuming that everybody can hear me now. Um, and I want to thank the Havens Wright Center for having me um, and to Don and Patrick and Sarah and Pete for making this possible and running all the tech and and to all of you who are here again from yesterday or here for the first time, I really appreciate your being here and I'm looking forward to um, a really good discussion after um, I talk for a little bit and I'm gonna put up some slides in just a minute. Um, as, as Don said, my book, The Long Deep Grudge, details the history of the Farm Equipment Workers Union or FE as it was known, which was one of the original industrial unions like the United Auto Workers or the Steel Workers that arose in the 1930s as part of the Congress of Industrial Organizations or CIO. The FE organized workers in the agricultural implement industry and managed to secure a multi-plant contract at the giant in the field, the notoriously anti-union International Harvester Corporation in 1941. And this is, of course, for those of you who were here yesterday, um, a bit about what I talked about then. International Harvester had several plants in Chicago, but many of its facilities, as was the case with other farm equipment manufacturers, were located in smaller towns in more rural areas in the Midwest. For this reason, the FE's membership, which reached about 80,000 in the, the mid-1940s, was overwhelmingly white. It's noteworthy then that the FE manifested from its founding a commitment to interracial solidarity that distinguished it even by comparison to unions that represented many more African-American workers. And it's also critical to underscore, especially for organizers and activists, that the FE's insistence on equality did not fracture the union. In fact, it came to serve as one of its pillars of strength. And so, okay, now let me just grab some slides for you. So you don't have to look at me the entire time. 
Alrighty. Now I showed this slide yesterday for those of you who were here then, um, but I'm repeating it because it speaks to the topic at hand today. The rank and file loved that union. That's what Frank Mingo, who is vice president of one of the FE's Chicago locals said. This fierce loyalty, and again, I talked about this yesterday, sustained the FE for a good period anyhow, as it was beset by a host of enemies in an increasingly hostile environment. This was true throughout the union, but perhaps most especially at the FE local that represented workers at International Harvesters Plant in Louisville, Kentucky. So today I'm gonna to focus on just what the FE did to achieve that. This is a remarkable story. And let me just say that while I'm gonna highlight some of the drama here, there is a lot more in the book and there are just some wonderful stories from the workers and organizers involved. So I really urge you to, um, to read it if this interests you. So let's consider first where the FE's orientation came from. From its founding and through much of the union's existence, the top officials of the FE and many of its key leaders were members of, or at least sympathetic to, the Communist Party. One FE leader who fit that profile and who is featured in the book was my father, DeWitt Gilpin, who joined the party early in the Great Depression and became an FE official in the late 1930s. It was also the political orientation shared by the FE's two top officials, President Grant Oaks and Secretary Treasurer Jerry Field, and all three are depicted here in this photo. And I should note as I did yesterday that even though my dad was very involved in this union, um, he died before I started doing this history. So I actually didn't um, learn a lot directly from him about the union. As historian Ellen Schrecker has argued, during the 1930s and 1940s, the Communist Party was the only political organization not specifically part of the civil rights movement that was dedicated to racial equality. This was not simply an altruistic goal, but a strategic imperative for, as Schrecker notes, the party saw the struggle for equal rights and full citizenship for African-Americans essential to the victory of proletarian revolution in the United States. In this era in the 1930s and 40s, an adamant insistence on full citizenship for African-Americans was a radical concept well outside the political mainstream since segregation was the rule throughout much of America on the job and in community life. But labor activists who were also communists, both black and white, were impelled to challenge that racist status quo. We can see evidence of this in the FE's organizing drive during the 1930s at International Harvester. Early FE literature promised to fight for black workers seeking better opportunities within the plants and made good on that even before the union won recognition when FE organizers secured a commitment from IH management to promote black workers into the machine shop in Harvester's Tractor Works plant in Chicago. Moves like this drew favorable attention from the Chicago Defender, the influential African-American newspaper. In 1941, when the FE went on strike to secure recognition at International Harvester, the Defender reminded its readers, some of whom were no doubt workers in Harvester's plants, that the FE led the fight for the promotion of Negroes to more skilled jobs. This commitment would continue after the FE secured its standing at Harvester. During its 1946 strike against IH, the FE fought for and won plant-wide seniority, a victory that especially benefited black workers who had been hired in greater numbers at IH plants during World War II. Thanks to this contract provision, the FE declared, every American is assured the right to a job and harvester based on ability, not prejudice. Its stance on plant-wide seniority distinguished the FE from other unions in this period, its arch rival, the non-communist United Auto Workers, for instance. The FE also proved exceptional in the visibility from top to bottom of black leadership in the union. When it was officially founded in 1938, 
the FE included one black member of its executive board and at its 1946 convention elected a second African-American to serve as vice president of the union. And this, thus at this point, two of the 11 members of the FE's executive board were African-American at a time when most unions, regardless of their political leanings or the membership's racial makeup, had none in official top leadership. Once again, the Chicago Defender was impressed. Union sets mark in race integration, read the front page headline. The FE, the Defender said, concretely showed that it does more than pay lip service to integration. And let me just note in this photo spread here, I mentioned yesterday that the FE vice president elected in um, 1946 was African-American A.J. Martin, the young man you can see sort of in the inset and kind of a blur there, um, who was also um, a Communist Party member. And A.J. Martin would um, step down from the union in 1949 rather than sign the, it's 1947, rather than sign the Taft-Hartley um, agreement, uh, uh, affidavits that were acquired of communists. And that's a whole episode that's really interesting um, and significant in my book. Um, thus, in these two key areas, contract terms and leadership representation, the FE had by 1946 already established a demonstrable track record on racial equality. That same year, when International Harvester opened a new plant in Louisville, the FE would seize the opportunity to affirm that commitment in especially dramatic and disruptive fashion. Moreover, the FE's experience in Louisville demonstrated the third essential component of the FE's model of interracial unionism, what could be called lived solidarity, the belief that continual struggle in the workplace against management involving both black and white workers was essential to forging unity and combating racism. And as was the case with its insistence on racial equality, the FE's belief that class solidarity could best be built through class warfare was rooted in the union leadership's racial radical ideology. The FE set up shop to begin its organizing campaign in Louisville as soon as the union got wind of International Harvester's intention to take over an enormous facility built by the government during World War II for aircraft production on the outskirts of the city. Its Louisville operation would be the first harvester opened in the South to be devoted to the production of a new smaller tractor, the Cub, best suited for Southern farms. All the plant's employees would be men, most quite young, a hefty percentage would be recently returned World War II veterans. The factory would soon become the largest in Kentucky, employing over 6,000 people at its height and was once the biggest tractor production facility in the world. But easy market access wasn't the only reason for Harvester's arrival in Louisville. IH joined the wave of capital flight that began after World War II as corporations flocked toward the low wage and far less unionized South. Harvester, in fact, planned to implement at its new Kentucky facility pay rates that were well below those in its northern plants. But Harvester bucked prevailing trends in one regard. Patrician and paternalistic IH President Fowler McCormick, the third generation McCormick to run the firm, in 1941 implemented a policy of non-discriminatory hiring at all Harvester factories, meaning that Blacks could be employed in assembly and machine departments. Harvester's policy was unusually progressive for the time, and particularly so in segregated Louisville, where nearly all employers relegated African Americans, if they hired them at all, to janitorial or laborers' positions. Within a few years after it opened, the workforce at the Louisville IH plant was about 15% Black, reflecting nearly exactly the African American population in the city. Harvester's employment practices, therefore, presented both an opportunity and a challenge to the FE as it set out in mid-1946, well before the plant began full production, to organize the Louisville factory. 
the UAW and an AFL union showed up some months later to vie for recognition at the plant. The FE's already solid reputation on civil rights could help galvanize support among black employees, but the prospect of an integrated factory meant that FE leaders needed to make a determination about how they'd approach white workers who would make up the vast majority of the workforce. African-American Jim Wright, who was one of the first workers hired at the plant and immediately signed on with the FE's effort, emphasized that the white securing jobs at IH, many of whom had come from rural Kentucky, were not initially an especially enlightened group. We had hillbillies, that's all we had, Wright said, farmers, guys who wore overalls, chewed tobacco, spitting on the floor, and those kind of guys were racist. I mean, real racist. As the FE saw it, their competitors seeking to win over the workforce seized on that widespread racism rather than seeking to combat it. The other unions trying for bargaining rights were organizing in the traditional Southern fashion, read an FE pamphlet. They were calling workers aside and promising them that as soon as they won bargaining rights, the Negroes on machines would be put back on brooms where they belonged. From the outset, however, Wright indicated, the FE's pitch was economic equality for all and they refused to compromise on that. The FE's approach was personified in the two men who led the Louisville organizing drive, Vernon Bailey, a white man and grizzled veteran of radical organizing efforts across the country, and Fred Marrero, a young black man who'd lived in Louisville most of his life and had already developed a reputation as an outspoken advocate for the African-American community. Marrero got a job in the plant and focused on recruiting black workers there and shortly reported that he'd secured a 100% rate of Negro membership in FE. And rather than soft pedal its message, that the only way to beat harvesters low wages was to unite Negro and white workers, the FE took it directly to the white workforce. Sterling Neal, another black worker who became a key leader of the Louisville FE, talked about how the union openly promoted discussion about what were highly provocative issues. We had meetings during the organizing campaign, Neal said in an interview, and at these meetings, the workers were encouraged to discuss freely the questions they had on their mind concerning the farm equipment union. It wasn't just upfront stuff of the organizer standing up, making big speeches, but the workers were encouraged to participate on such controversial questions as Negroes working in the plant, when it was a rare thing in this community for Negroes to hold any position above the status of janitor or laborer. These were discussed freely and openly on the floor. Sometimes there was an objection openly on the part of a white worker to the union's policy of no discrimination. On many occasions, the white workers who understood this question a little better challenged them on the floor. As a sidebar, let me note what this example offers up to organizers today grappling with how to deal with white working class racism. FE organizers were urgent and unwavering in their insistence on equality, but they combined that with adaptivity and patience and earned the respect of skeptical workers and even some ardent racists by listening rather than simply lecturing or scolding. While these difficult conversations were ongoing, FE supporters in the plant began functioning like union representatives well before any formal recognition had been granted to ensure that all workers there could see what FE membership could mean for them. Vernon Bailey, meanwhile, concerned himself with the vital tasks of building committees and fostering communication, including the publication of a union newspaper with content that Bailey described as quite heavy, but that nonetheless proved highly popular. The organizing drive stretched into 1947 when a labor relations board election was finally held that summer. Whether the FE's interracial strategy would pay off was uncertain given the realities of Southern life in the mid 20th century. 
the hotly contested election between the three competitors, the FE, the UAW, and the AFL, spurred high turnout as nearly every worker at the Louisville plant cast a ballot. FE supporters were elated and admittedly a bit stunned when the FE won handily, capturing nearly 70% of the vote. Their celebration was marred only by the fact that Vernon Bailey, who had worked early and late and endlessly, the union said, to secure the FE's victory, had collapsed and died from a heart attack at the age of 59, just a few weeks before the election. Jim Wright, Sterling Neal, and Fred Marrero all became officials within newly established FE Local 236, with Marrero elected secretary treasurer. The FE staffer assigned to Louisville to replace Bailey was Bud James, a patrician turned firebrand who'd abandoned his University of Chicago education, first to join the Communist Party, and then to sign on as an FE organizer. And elected as the local's president was politically radical Chuck Gibson, a white worker from the plant's assembly department. Gibson, originally from Vermont, had only recently arrived in Kentucky after marrying a woman from Louisville he met during World War II. But he possessed character traits which allowed him to mesh easily with his Southern coworkers. He was a wild guy, a powerful and courageous guy, as Bud James described Gibson. I mean, he'd go out and drink all night and be back the next day just fighting the company like hell and the guys really went for him as a leader. Within this group, the oldest was in his early 30s and all but Neil had seen active combat during World War II. These leaders of the Louisville FE shared a common belief something hitherto almost unknown in Louisville, union literature said, that through their policy of militant trade unionism, their conviction that once the Negro and white workers were united, the low wage system of the South would collapse. And so in, 19, in 1947, barely a month after the recognition battle ended, the Louisville FE charged into an even bigger fight, challenging International Harvester over the very reason the company had come to Kentucky in the first place. In doing so, Local 236 put into practice this concept of lived solidarity that would define the Louisville FE going forward. Harvester claimed a belief in Louisville and its future brought it to the city but Local 236 insisted the company was instead drawn by bright dreams of cheap Southern labor. Wages are set in accordance with the generally prevailing rates in a given community, so Harvester said, to defend its Louisville pay scale, the lowest at any IH factory. It was this Southern differential that lo Local 236 leaders vowed to eliminate. But before taking on management, they first needed to convince the Louisville workforce that they were owed more than they were being offered. Initially, it was a tough sell. Harvesters' wages were at least as good as those paid by nearby employers. And for Blacks in particular, the plant promised opportunities unavailable elsewhere. Jim Wright remembers that even he had to be persuaded at first. To the common guy on the street that got a job at Harvester, well, you'd think he'd gone to heaven. They give those guys jobs, give them a machine. Hell, a Negro couldn't even look at a machine anywhere. They wouldn't even let him clean it up. And here they were running it, had all these benefits and things. If a guy in Indianapolis or someplace like that, doing the same job like I was on, and I was getting 35 cents an hour less than he was getting, I used to think that was all right. Yet the local 236 leadership hammered away at the differential. We make the same tractors harvester sells to the same farmers. They don't sell a Southern tractor one penny cheaper than they sell another tractor, Sterling Neal said, recalling the arguments they used. We are not going to be second-class citizens in the South. To prevail on this point, Local 236 leaders insisted that racial unity was essential. FE literature emphasized that the Southern bosses for generations had played Negro against white and white against Negro 
and insisted there was a direct connection between that and the fact that Southern workers were the lowest paid in the country. FE leaders in Louisville hoped they had convinced workers, both black and white, to challenge their status as second-class citizens within the harvester empire. It was nonetheless a gamble when on September 17, 1947, a union contingent went to the front office with petitions calling for the elimination of the Southern differential. But when the plant manager refused to discuss the matter, a lot of us, a lot of the workers spontaneously began to shout, let's hit the bricks, Sterling Neal recalled. It wasn't started as a strike, it was merely a demonstration in the shop, Bud James said, adding, however, that the guys were so startled by their own strength that they pulled out together and the plant emptied out. The local, which hadn't begun collecting dues and had only $61 in its treasury, didn't have a union hall yet, so James scrambled to find one. FE leaders were also uncertain whether their walkout was legal, especially because this new law, the Taft-Hartley Act, had just been passed. So they dubbed it a continuous meeting. Local 236 didn't even have a membership roster or a list of employees. So the day after the strike began, they put out a call for workers to come by the new union hall in downtown Louisville to sign up for picket duty, or rather register as meeting notifiers, figuring that way they'd be able to collect just a few names. The response stunned even the leadership, as James recalled. Well, the next day, something like 2,000 people showed up, and there was a double line, and the girls at the typewriters spent the whole day giving them their slips and their duties. This double line stretched out into the hall, down the stairs, and onto the sidewalk and clear around the block. They waited all day in line to register for that strike. I'll never forget that line. With this early demonstration of enthusiasm, the walkout became what Jim Wright called a humdinger. Production was entirely halted at the plant as sizable and aggressive picket lines patrolled the gates, at first turning back even management personnel. This was too much for Harvester to accept and 10 days into the walkout, IH secured an injunction limiting to two the number of strikers at any of the plant's six entrances. This didn't change things much, however, as strikers still congregated near the plant, sometimes over a thousand strong, waiting to take their turn on the lines. Since the surrounding area was then largely vacant countryside, the police tolerated the throngs so long as they stood away from the gates. But they frequently pressed too close. In one two-day stretch in October, for instance, 30 union members, both black and white, including Chuck Gibson, Bud James, who you see here in the photo, Fred Marrero, and Jim Wright, were arrested for various forms of picket line misconduct. Gibson was, char was charged with overturning a plant foreman's car while the foreman was still in it. Once out on bail, they were back at it again. James was hauled in at least six times during the strike. Though Harvester invited employees to return, few did. The union claimed only a few dozen white workers and no African-Americans crossed the picket lines. In Louisville, there hadn't been a successful strike in an industry, Sterling Neal indicated, since anybody could remember. It wasn't like Detroit or Chicago or Pittsburgh or someplace where shops had been shut down. It had just never been done here. Yet the locals rank and file took easily to aggressive and creative labor activism. One morning, 800 World War II veterans in the local wearing their old uniforms paraded around the plant led by an African-American former Marine Sergeant. On another occasion, they parked their cars three abreast on the street leading to the plant. Traffic was gridlocked as the union conducted a meeting in the middle of the road. The FE also appealed to the broader public, insisting that Harvester is not being a good citizen of this community. The differential enriched the company and the McCormick's union literature said, while Louisville workers can afford to buy less consumer goods 
less services, less of what the farmer produces. On their loan hand-operated mimeograph machine secured on credit, we ran off about 10,000 handbills a day, so Neil said, and union members went out onto the street corners and left that stuff all over town. Some material was distributed even further afield. Quite a few of the boys had relatives all around through what we call Kentuckiana, between here and Indianapolis and as far south as the Tennessee line. And those fellows making the trips over the weekend while we were on strike, they'd take a lot of those handbills and they'd lead them off in the little hamlets and the general stores, Neil recalled. Striker spouses as well, visiting scores of rural communities, help circulate flyers pointing out to small farmers, the IH Cubs customer base, that they would not get a tractor any cheaper if the tractor was made in Louisville, but still the company wanted to pay a cheaper wage. All this activity transformed the locals' membership. Everybody was cutting everybody's throat in this area, Neil said, of race relations among workers, and thus outside the FE, everyone was sure we were gonna lose when the strike began. This is a Southern town and the thinking of the guys is Southern, Sterling Neal said. But one thing that happened during that strike, the fellows met together in the hall, they ate together, they picketed together and they practically lived together down in the hall, which was an unusual thing. It was the first strike in Louisville when Negro and white guys were really out on the picket lines battling together. As a result, Jim Wright said, the 1947 walkout unified the people in nascent Local 236. International Harvester, of course, made its own appeals during the walkout. In late October, Harvester sent a letter to all its employees decrying the situation in Louisville. The company wants good relations with responsible unions, but with the FE that was impossible, the letter said, since FE officials were irresponsible radicals. The letter concluded with this advice to harvester workers, get yourself some new leaders. Those irresponsible radicals in the union's top leadership responded by threatening to pull all 35,000 harvester workers in the FE out on strike because the precedent in Louisville would allow the company to cut wages throughout the chain. Harvester capitulated, granting hefty wage increases to end the walkout. On October 27th, after more than 40 days on strike, the members of Local 236 returned to work with two smashing victories in hand, so said the FE News, one over International Harvester, the other over the Mason-Dixon low wage line. The Southern differential strike had proved to harvester workers in Louisville, white and black, that militant interracial solidarity paid off quite literally. It was an experience that the irresponsible radicals in the union's leadership, both national and local, endeavored to ensure that FE members everywhere repeated on a regular basis. Thus much to Fowler McCormick and Harvester management's dismay, though probably not to their surprise, their concession on the Southern differential bought them no lasting peace in Louisville. Yesterday, I discussed International Harvester's pernicious incentive wage system and the discontent it generated on the shop floor and the FE's determination to respond to workers' grievances immediately through work stoppages or slowdowns. Walkout rates at all harvester plants represented by the FE were extraordinarily high and nowhere would this prove more true than in Louisville. A fantastic pyrotechnic series of disputes characterized the plant, so the Louisville Courier Journal declared in 1949. The many walkouts were essential, at least as far as the union was concerned, to ensure that wages at the Louisville plant remained far higher than other Southern factories. But the tactic required that solidarity be unconditional and widespread. See, if everybody walks out, the whole plant 
then the company couldn't fire all of you, Jim Wright said. The unity of the guys, the sticking together of the guys kept mass firings from happening. The frequent walkouts and slowdowns that Local 236 engaged in, therefore, could be effective only when black and white workers acted in concert. And thus, interracial solidarity became not an abstract construct, but a daily practice that delivered tangible and immediate benefits to the union membership. Just what that looked like in practice can be glimpsed in a walkout that took place in early 1949, when some two dozen workers in one department in the plant, impelled by an incentive wage dispute, quit work and went to the front office to register their complaint. The two workers that Harvester held to be the ringleaders of the protest, Fred Marrero and shop steward Robert Mims were black. The remaining men in the department were white. When the company responded to the work stoppage by firing Marrero and Mims, the entire membership of Local 236 promptly responded by emptying out the plant. 3,000 walk out as protest against firing two proclaimed the headline in the Louisville Defender, the town's black newspaper, registering how extraordinary such an action was on various levels. Charlie Yates, a dedicated local 236 steward who'd grown up in rural Kentucky, acknowledged when he was interviewed in the early 1950s that he had entered the harvester plant carrying the same beliefs as many other whites who had it beat into their heads that colored people were always lower than they were. But workers with such attitudes could change, Yates knew, because his experience in Local 236 had changed him. I realized I was no damn different than a colored person, he said, and he maintained that the fights in the shop have done more to bring people over to our side. I can't remember a case when a fellow had a grievance in a department and being white or colored, whatever he was, if he had a grievance, the rest of the shop had a grievance with him. Not that the FE leadership in Louisville presumed that demonstrations in the shop would be enough in and of themselves to eradicate the racism that was second or first nature to much of the plant's Southern white workforce. One of the first organizations that noted civil rights activist Ann Braden worked with was the Louisville FE. And she would later call local 236 leader Sterling Neal, one of her most important mentors. She observed how local 236 waged a constant campaign to convince the white workers that only by solidarity of Negro and white workers would the union be strong. I never went to a meeting, Braden said, that somebody didn't get up and make a speech about the reason we're so strong and we can win. And they always said that they had the highest wages in the South, and I never saw that refuted anywhere. The reason we've got that is because we stick together, black and white. They attack a black worker and we're there to do something. We're gonna walk out of that plant. This is the reason we've got this strong union. And they preached that constantly. Jim Wright, who judged the whites in the plant as real racists when the FE's organizing drive began, never ceased to be astonished at how membership in Local 236 had redeemed those men. They'd go along with Blacks, eat with them, go places with them, go hunting with them, work on a machine with them, have fun in the shop with them, Wright said. <clears throat> that was a new thing for the white workers. The union had put some sort of religious feeling of them sticking together. The transformative power that came through this religious feeling of solidarity carried beyond the plant gates. It registered in the deep friendships that developed between black and white workers, relationships that disrupted social norms in Louisville. Jim Mauser, a white worker and F.E. Stewart at the Harvester plant, and Jim Wright became particularly close, for instance, and the two frequently socialized together with each other's families. Mauser recalled how unusual that was at the time. Louisville just wasn't ready for blacks and whites together, he said. 
I can remember the first time Val, my wife, and I went to Jim's and his wife's house for dinner. You'd see Blacks look up and say, what's going on here? And vice versa when they would visit us. And the members of Local 236 did more than just integrate each other's homes. By the early 1950s, Jim Wright indicated, each weekend, we mapped out an area of Louisville to do something in we weren't supposed to do that was against the law. The laws they sought to test were those mandating separate and patently unequal spheres for blacks and whites throughout Louisville. The we in this instance included several dozen of the most fervent members of Local 236, some black and some white, including Jim Mauser and Charlie Yates. The integrated group first made multiple forays into Cherokee Park, a bucolic, well-equipped and whites only 400 acre expanse. And each time they were ejected by the police, often forcibly. They beat us up, knocked us on the head, knocked us on the ground and had us running everything, Wright said. They received the same treatment in the city's swanky and strictly segregated downtown hotels. The contingent of FE members barely made it into the lobby of the Brown Hotel before the police, Wright said, just massacred us. They beat us, just drug us out. Several repeated attempts met with the same show of force. In addition to these guerrilla style assaults on whites only locations, the Louisville FE also took a leading role in the more formal and less bruising legal and political struggles against discrimination. Local 236 played a prominent role in Kentucky's interracial hospital movement, for instance, which by the mid 1950s succeeded in barring hospitals that refused to provide emergency care to blacks from receiving state licenses. And in 1949, Local 236 itself, spurred in fact by the women's auxiliary of the local, began holding integrated and well-attended dances at its union hall, again offering up a direct challenge to Louisville's segregated social norms. Here are some of the local 236 spouses and children on the Effie picket line in 1952. Later in his life, Jim Wright reflected on all the activities the Louisville Effie had been involved in. You know, it's kind of ironic, he said. All that stuff we were doing back then, that was prior to Martin Luther King's time. I never thought about that. We were struggling and fighting and getting put in jail, the same stuff that King did. I guess it was ripe for him to grasp it. It was ripe for him to start it. I never thought of that, but King came in, King came in there in 1955 after I left the South and all the stuff I was doing, me and Mauser and Neil and everybody else was doing, that was back in 51, 50, 49, 48. Wright indeed left Louisville for Chicago in 1955, joining the staff of the UAW there after the FE dissolved and was absorbed into the UAW. Now, just as I said yesterday, I'm not gonna tell the whole complicated, consequential and very dramatic story of the FE's demise. For that, you'll have to read my book. And there really are, again, as I said, terrific stories involving all of these efforts on uh, the part of the Louisville FE um, in that book. But as further incentive for you to read it, let me note that Jim Wright became a prominent figure in the UAW and in the labor movement generally. In 1980, the Chicago Tribune singled him out as one of the nation's top black labor leaders. But nonetheless, Wright always regarded the FE as the closest to the most perfect union he'd ever known. Yesterday, I spoke about the bitter contest between the communist influenced FE leadership who promoted a model of trade unionism based on class warfare and Walter Ruther of the UAW who embraced a more cooperative class collaborative framework. I talked broadly about how the UAW's victory in that ideological battle ultimately served to weaken the labor movement in general. But here let's think about how the loss of the FE's combative conception of trade unionism has also undermined the fight for social justice and racial equality. As far as the FE leadership was concerned, 
engagement in ongoing shop floor rank and file militancy or lived solidarity was utterly requisite to confronting and overcoming the deeply held reservoirs of white supremacy in America. The UAW, to be sure, developed a solid reputation for its support of civil rights in the 1960s, as Walter Ruther was an early and visible ally of Martin Luther King. But at the same time, the UAW's retreat from shop floor activism in favor of long contracts and bureaucratic grievance procedures meant that black and white workers had ever fewer opportunities to engage in common struggle. This reality has contributed to the toxic racism that still afflicts segments of the working class, not least, unfortunately, among many white UAW members. It was through the many strikes and the fights in the shop as Charlie Yates recognized that white workers at Louisville's harvester plant, those real racists, as Jim Wright described them, men who initially fit the bill as deplorables, if ever anyone did, learned to reject the racism that was part of their Southern heritage. Those white workers together with the black members of FE Local 236 learned through daily experience that solidarity paid off in the literal sense of meaning more money in their pockets and more tolerable, safer working conditions. Moreover, through those recurring battles against management, workers learned about each other and from each other. They learned to trust and rely on one another. And through that, they developed bonds that had profoundly transformative power for themselves personally and for the community they lived in. So as we consider what the labor movement can and must do to challenge both economic and racial inequality, I'd argue that the FE story suggests that you simply can't do one without the other. Both require, as Anne Braden said, a constant campaign, one that is immediate, fearless, and relentlessly militant. Right. Let me take this down. Thank you so much, Tony, for such an engaging and quite frankly, uh, inspiring second talk. So we have ample time for questions and comments until 2 p.m. Central. So as a reminder, you're welcome to either activate your camera and microphone to ask a question directly or you can submit a question through the chat, which I'll read aloud. And to ask a question directly, you can move your cursor to the reactions tab in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen and select raise hand and will then enable you to turn on your microphone. So I do see uh, that Mike Goodman has a question in the chat from earlier in your presentation, Tony, but I also wanted to give you space to open up the floor to um, some, some people who might be with us. Right, I want to, before I answer some questions, I wanna welcome a couple people who are in the audience and I'm hoping that they might offer a few remarks. First, Beverly Watkins, who was with us yesterday, is here again today. And Beverly is the daughter of Sterling Neal. And so she is a longtime Louisville and, and a, um, a, someone who might be able to at least chat a little bit with us about what it was like um, in her household growing up in this FE milieu and what you might have to add to the talk or where I get, whatever I got wrong, please um, <laughs> feel free to, to point that out. Oh, you didn't get anything wrong. Um, <laughs> Anything that I add really just confirms what you said. Uh, as a, Remember, I was a child at that time, and I was one of those children who uh, walked on the picket line and then were taken to school. <laughs> we didn't get the day off, but that was fair for sure. But so, you know, we did socialize um, with white people, which was very strange in our neighborhood. I lived in a segregated neighborhood in the California neighborhood in Louisville. But, you know, it became very commonplace for us, and it was not anything unusual in the end for us. Um, my mother uh, organized strike kitchens. You know, we helped out there. Um, we um, 
went on picnics. We went to their houses. Uh, white, I'm talking about white members now. They came to ours. So that was part of the, the racial part of that was uh, definitely emphasized and uh, we experienced that. Um, later on, uh, as my father was concerned, he was called up uh, from the House on Americans Activities Committee and ended up in losing his job as a organizer for the UAW at that time. So that was a stressful time for us and um, fearful. I remember a lawyer coming to the house. I remember going to school after the news, the articles in the newspaper, but we were always fairly, uh, I will say assertive or maybe just combative, I don't know. But you know, we were ready, but we, were, we dared anybody to say anything. You know, we were, that's how we approached everything in those days, so. Um, but he taught us, and my mother also taught us a lot about uh, social responsibility and uh, nobody was better than you and nobody was worse than you. And uh, you had responsibility to the community. And so in our family, uh, you mentioned earlier that my brother's a state senator. My young, my older brother who was deceased, was an attorney. He, stopped, he started a, a drug rehab program here in Louisville in the 60s. He was, became a director of a community organization. My sister had helped to establish the Black Nurses Association in Cincinnati. Um, I worked in the civil rights movement. I was in a, as a high school student, I was the president of the, lo the local core chapter. That was during the sit-in days. And after that, I did uh, my volunteer work in literacy uh, for adults. And then since then, uh, various members of the family have done various things. I have a niece that's very active in uh, economic justice, uh, a nephew who is in the same area. And um, it's just the tradition that's passed down in the family. Um, so the legacy lived on. My father loved to say that it really started with uh, his grandmother who went to a Catholic church in Louisville, they were Catholic and a uh, segregated church and she decided she wanted to sit up front and she did and the usher asked her to move and she said to him can't you see i'm trying to pray and so after that black people sat wherever they wanted to sit in that church so it started pretty early in our family so but anyway that legacy of the the union uh sort of lives on in our minds and it really um one of the things that i find this hard to see is how diminished the effect of the unions have come, become uh, in the workplace. And I've lived a long time in most, mostly Southern states in my adult life and a whole lot of right to work laws. And so the union's effectiveness is very much decreased and I really hate to see that, but uh, the FE definitely had a strong influence during its years. Um, and so the memories are very fine from that period of time. And also, I should point out that your mother actually is, um, uh, I tell this wonderful story about her through the interviews that were done and um, about her playing this active role in the women's auxiliary, as it's mm -hmm. called then, and which was also something that Ann Braden was heavily involved mm -hmm. in, and how your mother approached at the first meeting, there were clearly white women who walked in and were kind of stunned to see that there were black women there as well. And, you know, this was something they weren't expecting, they weren't um, ready for. And there was a woman in particular, a white woman who came in named Jane Mahoney, uh -huh. that your mother um, made a point of sitting next to, and Jane was obviously very uncomfortable about this. And it's just this wonderful story about how your mom then like made it a point after this meeting to kind of call up Jane on some pretext or another and she'd get her to start talking about their kids and they mm -hmm. they kind of start talking about things that the mothers had in common and and through that they ended up with this friendship that became right. like a fierce friendship and and she, your mom talks about Jane Mahoney like um defending her and they stayed friends all their lives right that's um true. That, that's and, absolutely true mm -hmm. Do you remember her? Was she somebody that I you- I don't knew? remember. I remember her name, but I actually don't remember Jane. Uh, but that is so like my mother who is deceased now, but she was a person who, that was her gift, was how she could relate to people. And um, I read about this and it's something that she had written and took to my kids and they, they just chuckled and they said, oh, that's grandmother Neil, all right, you know. 
So yeah, she was, um, and she, one thing that she also mentioned in something that she wrote about that was that the male members, the members of the union weren't too uh, happy about the auxiliary being formed. They were very resistant in the beginning. And of course the women said, hey, you know, we're gonna do this anyway. And of course it was a great uh, benefit to them too because they ended up helping with, you know, all sorts of things like stuffing envelopes and all those sorts of things. Not to mention running a, a strike kitchen and so forth, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the women were the ones who wanted to have the dances and the men initially, right. including Jim Wright talked about how they also, and Ann Braden talked about how all the men said, no, you know, it's okay for us to get together in the shop and, but not those dances, that's too much. That's, you know, mm -hmm. Dangerous, but yeah, they came to blows over happened. some of those issues. Some individuals uh, who uh, hadn't given up their racist ideas, men I'm talking about now. So, in some situations, my father told me of some several stories where you know they came to blows because of racial epithets and so forth. But eventually, those people also became, as Jane Mahoney, they saw that we're just the same people all trying to do the same thing, really. So it was a wonderful experience from that experience, from that standpoint. Well, I think that's one of the real important um, aspects of the book that I really thought about and grappled with is that you had, you know, we're talking about the then segregated South, we're talking about the pre-civil rights, um, the height of the pre-civil rights movement, and you had African Americans like your father, who obviously were faced with, um, with, with, as Jim Wright said, real racists. And yet they were determined to kind of, you know, as your mom says, I think, break them down. Like not just say, okay, you know, we're not gonna talk to them. I mean, obviously they couldn't have, if they had taken that attitude, they never would have been able to organize the union. Right. It's largely right. white, you know? So, but they didn't just, and I'm sure there must've been some obviously in the shop who they just, who were too inveterate in their racism, you know, and they just had to write them off. But obviously their general intent was we're gonna convince all these people that solidarity and racial unity is, is necessary. And they mm -hmm. certainly managed to do that in, in obviously with people who they didn't expect to initially. So that's, it's a really extraordinary story and really one is. of tremendous determination. So, um, and heroism, so it's, it's a terrific story. So read the book out there, everyone. And I think there's, um, there. I think that Kay Tillo is also on this call. Is Kay out there somewhere? Because I believe that Kay worked, if she can come on, um, I think Kay worked directly with Ann Braden. So I'm not sure if Kay's going to come on. So maybe I should answer. Oh, there's Kay. Can Kay, can you add a few words maybe about your experience as a lifelong Louisville resident and your experience in the movement? Um, uh, well, I don't know what to say. I, uh, when I found out about your thesis, uh, which was written on this topic, and I had to get that and uh, found out a lot of things about Louisville that I didn't know. And I think it's something that uh, uh, Kentuckians can be really proud of and that uh, it's something our union movement needs to know about here because uh, uh, we are now struggling with uh, a lot of backward steps and two-tier wage systems and a weakening in a way that uh, you know is, is causing increasing poverty. And uh, we need uh, this union, this history that is a part of our heritage uh, as a part of re-strengthening what we can do in Kentucky. So. Thanks for doing all that writing and thank you. I got to know Beverly because of this book because oh, I, went looking, I went looking for her. I wanted to know <laughs> about this Neil family. So uh, I, uh, oh, I found her. I found, well, first I found Ebony and then she yeah. helped me to find Beverly who I located. So uh, it's a story really important, I think to us in Kentucky, but nationally. And of course, the, the idea of unions that will take on the fight rather than uh, 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 want to be closer to the company, that's the key issue right now for the union movement. Right. Well, I didn't realize that the book had facilitated your two connecting, so that's wonderful. That's, that's enough, that's, if, that's, if that's enough to have accomplished. Um, and, I, and 
and I, I know there are questions and I want to get to the questions, um, but I, the, what you said, Kay, I mean, one of the things that also struck me that I spoke about briefly was during the, this, the, the uh, Southern differential strike in 47, I mean, one of the things that I thought was really important that the union did was that obviously um, the easier, I mean, you know, as Jim Wright said, a lot of the workers in the plant, white and black, thought that they were getting a great deal already, you know, that they were getting every, you know, that they had, their wages were better, they had better opportunities. So what was, you know, why, you know, why ask for more? And, uh, you know, the, the, the FE's attitude going in that they really, I think, ultimately, um, or fairly quickly managed to con Vince workers of was that they were entitled to much more than that, you know, just because the, 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 um, the fight should be for all workers to come up here, not for um, some workers to, to, for the workers up here to have to come down here to match the workers at the bottom. So, so it's the same thing we're seeing now with the two kind of two tier wage systems. I mean, everybody should be getting those top wages, not, um, not new hires don't really deserve as much, or, you know, you should have to, you know, so, so the, the, the fight to um, the insistence that um, workers deserved more and that you shouldn't um, take the company's word for what it is that you um, deserve was something that I think was also pretty important in um, the mentality of the, the workers there was that they, they came to believe that they really deserved um, as much and every day more than they were getting. Um, so the bold, the sorry? boldness of the boldness of the union was amazing and the tremendous confidence in workers yeah. that workers were not ignorant, that workers could learn, that workers could uh, express a human, uh, a humanity. And uh, that's so needed uh, today within our labor movement. Incidentally, I just wanted to say, I went looking for that Chuck Gibson that young uh, president, he's he's buried here in the um, uh, uh, Zachary Taylor uh, 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 <laughs> cemetery. I wanted to see what they had on his tombstone and there's nothing that shows who he was because the workers there at the plant closed it down on the day he died, you know, and uh, um, went out and, you know, paraded. They closed the plant down a lot, but they closed it down uh, for, uh, for Chuck Gibson and uh, to go to his funeral. So uh, there's a lot, just a lot that um, we have still to learn about it, but thank you for uncovering much of it. Yeah, that's another dramatic story. I mentioned that Vernon Bailey, the kind of veteran organizer who came in to organize the Louisville plant, died, you know, suddenly and tragically during the organizing drive and this tremendously talented and obviously uh, incredibly charismatic young local president also shortly after that Southern differential strike collapsed and died. And so, um, so that's a story I tell and the union was very suspicious about what happened. And so um, that's it. That, and, you know, but it was true that the funeral literally closed um, the plant because all the workers left to go to the funeral. And, and it was very moving that several of the workers I interviewed and, and Jim Wright, um, you know, still got choked up talking about Chuck Gibson and how, um, how that death affected them. So um, there's a lot of real good human interest, I think, in these stories and, and the relationships that people developed. So let me jump to the questions. Which one should I take first, Tara, because you have the um, oh, sure. Yes, yeah, so there are quite a few questions in the chat as, as well as some wonderful messages of solidarity. So maybe we'll, we'll give you a, a few at a time so that we make sure to get through as many as possible, if that's okay, Tony. Um, so the, the first one from Mike Goodman, was FEU impacted by the passage of Taft-Hartley, which occurred in the same year as the victory over IHC? And another right. from Alan Ruff. Um, might you tell us something more about Frederick Marrero and his background? I couldn't help to notice his Latino surname. And then I suppose if you want to answer those, then we'll go to John Melrod, who has been waiting as well. Okay. Um, yeah, and the, so the Taft-Hartley Act, as I mentioned really briefly, it did kind of immediately affect the um, strike in the sense that um, and this was, of course, a strike between contracts, so that's 
that was already something that was of questionable legality. So, but the Taft-Hartley Act, which had literally just been passed months before, um, made that even more questionable. So that becomes an issue. And in fact, um, Senator Hartley makes it, and there's, this is in the book, and um, makes a point of saying something, you can't call it a continuous meeting, it's still a strike. And in fact, we're gonna amend the language to make sure that um, it's clear that this kind of action is um, illegal. But you know, as as obviously a part of the FE's ethos was that you know you can call something illegal, but if you have the strength in the shop to you know these strikes that they were engaging in, um, these walkouts that they were engaging in were always you know not really um, legal. The kinds of you know picket line activities that they engaged in, you know, the company would get injunctions and they would defy the injunctions. But again, to be able to succeed in that, the um, the, the union required this kind of intense solidarity and commitment, um, which was uh, a challenge to maintain. And the whole story of Taft-Hartley and the way it affected the FE as one of the left-wing unions that was expelled from the CIO, as I talked about yesterday, is really important because um, two of the leaders, the elected leaders of top officials of the union, as I mentioned early um, in this talk, were African Americans, um, Hope Huff from McCormick Works and A.J. Martin um, were both um, elected officials of the FE. So when the union has to grapple with this, the implication of the um, Taft-Hartley Act and several of the top leaders um, step down rather than, uh, than agree to sign these non-communist affidavits that the Taft-Hartley Act required. Two of them, Pope Huff and um, A.J. Martin are African-American. There are other African-Americans who step into those positions um, after they um, step down. And there's a whole story of what that meant and the drama also because two of the other white leaders um, also resigned. So um, how, how that affected the union is really important. And I kind of have to read the Book, but it was, you know, it was seen as not just a Taft Hartley then as not just a dagger aimed at the left in general. It had a very specific and targeted effect on the left-wing African American leaders who were um, an important part of unions like the FE. AJ Martin had been recognized by the national press. There was a write-up about him in. Ebony Magazine as this young rising labor leader, African-American labor leader, and then to sort of be, um, to be, uh, to find himself faced with this moral choice um, that um, was so difficult for him to make, um, was really, it's really a dramatic and important story. So there's no question that, that Taft Hartley had all kinds of impacts on the FE and, and, and much of that is laid out in the book. As to Fred Marrero, he's another, you know, wonderful story that you have to um, read the book to find out about. He was, he had a union background, he came from New Orleans, so I can't tell you about his name besides that, but he was born in New Orleans, came to, to Louisville early in his life, was um, already a union activist before the, before International Harvester had come to, um, to Louisville. There was an enormous um, uh, uh, facility what's called Jeff Boat, which is um, in Indiana, right across the border um, from Louisville, right across the river, where, which was in a huge facility during World War II. And uh, Marrero worked there as did, I believe, Sterling Neal worked there, I think. Or, yes, right, Beverly's nodding her head. So though it, they knew each other and had been involved in union activism, that was an AFL union and a corrupt one. So um, Fred Marrero was very involved in fighting the corruption and that, and that was like, dangerous work when he got drafted and went off to World War II because he'd gotten in literal fights and all kinds, there was just all kinds of drama in this AFL local. So when Fred Marrero got drafted and, and went off to, to fight in Europe, he said he thought he'd be safer there than he was um, involved in this, this union, this AFL, this corrupt AFL union. So then he comes back and um, gets involved in the FE as soon as he's back um, from World War II. But he'd also been, um, very involved in like, for example, there are many letters that he wrote to the Louisville Courier Journal about segregation in Louisville. He was very active in um, black organizations in Louisville. So some of that story is told in, um, in my book. And he, he was just a really um, also fascinating 
character very important in what was the early civil rights movement um, before we sort of think of it having taken off. Wonderful. So uh, John, go ahead, John Melrod, that is. Yeah, the, the first thing I wanted to say is how important Tony's book has already become. I work with two groups of young people who've gone in to Amazon facilities, one on in the Inland Empire and the other on the Northeast. And in those discussions, I've talked about the importance of dealing with issues of racial disparity and discrimination being so important to their unionizing effort. And I've referred to them to read the book. And they've actually begun to read the book. And I think it's such a perfect example of the best union uh, practice around racism and the national question that I, I think exists out there anywhere. But quickly, in, in regard to yesterday, I, I just finished a manuscript on a memoir, and I have all my notes, and it was very easy for me to find a question. Somebody asked, did the 1941 Alice Chalmers strike have a broader impact on um, labor? And it was actually the 1941 strike had to do with, there was a controversy, blocking production for the Navy because the CP's position wasn't to enter the war at that point. So there wasn't that much support. But in 46, there was an 11th month, 11 month strike um, at Alice Chalmers and at American Motors in Kenosha, which was then a Nash plant at 11 a.m. on, a, on it, the day of a large march they closed the plant at 11. They marched from the plant, 5,000 people, to the Lakeshore Stadium, held a rally in support of the Alice Chalmers strike, and then 1,500 went by bus and car to join a massive picket line. And the four that were arrested from the local were paid by the local for the time they spent in jail. Um, so the answer to that question yesterday was, yes, it clearly did have an impact beyond uh, West Dallas. Um, but I just wanted to say, in terms of when I was looking at my history, I don't know if you can see this, but it's the Nash Worker. It's the first issue of the, com the Communist Shop Nuclei at the Kenosha Nash plant, put out in 1932. I mean, I love the slogan. It's organized grievance committees join the Communist Party. Um, sort of an equivalency that we wouldn't really recognize today. But the, the tradition that was established was when the black workers in 1960 broke out of the foundry because they refused to accept a wage, uh, uh, de no, not a wage decrease, an increase in production with no increase in manpower. And they were dispersed throughout the entire plant of about 10,000 people. They immediately became leadership stewards, chief stewards, board members, and that had a huge impact on the local. I mean, all through the history, you know, in 65, 250 marched from the local in support of black, you know, voting rights. What they 10,000 people from the local petitioned Eisenhower to, you know, desegregate the public schools. When we came into the plant, and there's another person on the call who was in another plant in Milwaukee, Laurie Rosen, one of the key issues was always fighting about racism. Every newsletter we put out, rank and file newsletter, dealt with two or three issues of a foreman, you know, calling out a black worker in racist terms, and we'd call that foreman scab of the month. You know, in another case, there'd be graffiti in the bathroom, black anti, you know, racist graffiti. We would start a group uh, grievance, make the company paint over the bathroom. So that it was, there was never a time that we didn't among the rank and file make that central to everything that we did. Now that had its consequences as well. When I was in a bar after work, I felt something in my stomach and the guy next to me says, I'm dead eye de Marino, you're that communist Jew. And I looked down, he had a 38 in my stomach and he, I said, well, why don't we talk about that? And in those days, I could drink like the Tony referred to the guy in the FE. We drank for about three hours. And at the end, he was hugging me and telling me how much he loved me. 
and he became a supporter of the caucus that we had. So, you know, there are deplorables that are irredeemable. There's also very many deplorables that are redeemable, which is why the union has to embrace, the unions, excuse me, have to embrace the ideology that Tony writes about at the FE. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the the Effie's example, and obviously there are others. I, you know, I certainly don't want to hold this up as the only example. And there are great books about other um, unions that did this kind of organizing in the South, like Robin Kelly's book and Mike Honey's work. And um, so, you know, there there are are many. But you know, it took immense courage. It took immense patience. It you know, and and one in a previous talk I gave, someone asked me if I, you know, if I had, if I had actually talked to people like Jim Wright or Sterling Neal about, you know, how they actually had those conversations. And you know, because I did many of these interviews a long time ago, um, unfortunately, that was not a question that I asked. And almost everyone involved in um, in the book, I mean, everyone who appears in the book is now. Um, past. So I really wish I had asked that question. I really wish I knew what those one-on-one -on -one conversations actually sounded like, because that's what organizing is, are those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And, you know, again, what I think the example here from the FE is that you can't just put stuff in your literature and say you're against racism. Um, you have to have these kind of lived experiences where workers are fighting together that gives workers the opportunity to see what they mean to each other. So, you know, I do think that unions have to have those continual struggles in workplaces. It doesn't have to be a big factory. It can be a hospital. It can be a, it can be a, a, a small shop, you know, um, but, but they, they do need to struggle together to see what they can win together. So let, I, and I don't want to, you know, I know people are waiting with other questions. So let me what should we, what's next, Sarah? So th this ties in well to John W's question and, and I'll read another one from David Simmons thereafter, if that's okay. So uh, John W who was born and raised in Kentucky in a railroad union family um, asks, where was the IH plant located in Louisville and did that impact the cross-cultural racial community implication, interactions rather? And uh, what you were just speaking to in a sense, what are the opportunities for black and white workers to connect in Louisville today, considering the amount of existing segregation and the current climate of the city? And then the next, I'll just feed you as well, okay. uh, from David Simmons is, when the CP leadership decreed that the unions expelled from the CIO should dissolve and their members work within the UAW and other unions, how did the FE leadership respond? Um, it looks like, first of all, the, the question about what's going on in Louisville today, I don't live in Louisville now, I'm not really, um, it looks like there might be somebody who says they, they live in Louisville now who could maybe speak to that in a minute after I, um, cause, so I'd rather hear from somebody who, and Kay is very active in all kinds of work in Louisville and Beverly, but maybe we can um, bring in Ira Grupper in a minute to, um, to, to say something about that. Um, in terms of where the plant was, um, I don't that the the slide that I showed early on showed that the plant was located where the airport is in Louisville now, the international airport. Um, and it now where it was is more or less covered over by a runway extension, I believe. At the time it was built, or at the time that the harvester took over what was a um, an air airplane uh, factory from World War II, there was really not much out there at all. So it's on the south east west corner of Louisville, um, not, you know, relatively close to Churchill Downs, but not, not, not then close to much of the residential areas in Louisville. So it's why that they had all that sort of open territory around it. And the city has grown up more since then. Um, so in terms of like how people and, and Louisville was very segregated then. There were white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. So people were coming from different directions. So again, this idea, for example, during this 47 strike of having this union hall in downtown Louisville that drew these workers um, and from, from these different neighborhoods into the same location was something that just wasn't happening on a normal, on a daily basis in, in Louisville. Um, and let's see, in terms of the, 
Second question about the, the sort of that speaks to kind of what happened with the FE at the end in 1955 when the FE leadership makes the decision to um, to leave the United Electrical Workers that they had affiliated with, as I said um, yesterday, one of the other left unions and move into the UAW. That was a very complicated decision and a bitter and painful one on, on many levels. Um, it really didn't, if you read my book, it, the, the FE leadership had by then pretty much dissolved their own connections, formal connections anyway, to the Communist Party. So it's my view that it wasn't, they did not do that because they were directed to by um, any sort, but because of any sort of communist directive, it came because of the consequences of a enormous loss in 1952 in this very bitter strike. And they were heading into the new negotiations in 1955 and Jim Wright and my father and Milt Burns and the people at the top who were making these, having these conversations about what they were gonna do, were really convinced that International Harvester was going to um, destroy the union in 1955 if they didn't. And the UAW had organized a good number of harvester truck plants. And so the idea was that it was necessary for um, there to be one union um, taking on International Harvester. And there was no chance that it was at this point that it would be that the FE could prevail over the UAW. So that, you know, that's the that's the brief summary of what happens. I'm sort of giving away the end, but it is again a dramatic consequential story. There were people who bitterly disagreed with that decision and who never spoke to other people again because of it. So it was a consequential um, decision. And again, details more in the book. Um, I'm looking at that. I, I see there's, do, I wonder if, if I know, and I know we're getting close to the end, but if there's somebody who um, wants to, if Ira wants to speak about maybe what's going on in Louisville now, that would be helpful if you're still there, Ira. Are you still there? I think Ira's still with us and I'm, oh, there we are, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I moved to Louisville in 1969, hired by Carl and Ann Braden to work for SCEF, the Southern Conference Educational Fund. I was one of the printers. And the influence that the FE had was still felt even after all those many years. Um, and uh, Beverly Watkins, I, don't, I think we've met once, but you, you, I, I met your father and I, and I know your, I mean, your grandfather and I know your was it your, your brother? I know your brother. Um, and, and the, the anti-racist aspect, I, I won't go too far afield, but just to say in 1938, a group of integrated people met in Birmingham, Alabama to form the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. It was an amazing organization. It was red baited out of existence. The only thing that remained was their fundraising arm called SCEF, the Southern Conference Educational Fund of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. Anne Braden and Carl Braden were greatly influenced by the FE. Their work in terms of civil rights advocacy extended not just to the, the, the fight for inter integration and treating people decently, but for the fight to integrate the labor movement into this larger picture. They were very active in the um, I was involved in organizing um, 1999, a national conference on the boycott of Rhodesian chrome and South African coal, well, now Zimbabwe. Um, and it was the Bradens that were very influential. They had already left SCEF, it was a different thing, and Carl Braden was no longer living. But the influence that the labor movement had working in tandem with SCEF is still being felt today. The, the current group, that's the, the, the prominent leader in protesting Breonna Taylor's assassination is the Southern Conference Educational Fund. The Southern Conference Educational Fund, again, came out of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, which worked very closely with the union. So it's, it, it, there is a continuum and it's still going on. And I um, wanted to note that my book came out just before the pandemic started. And 
Of course, um, I had had plans to go down to Louisville and talk about the book directly in Louisville. So it's been really painful that I haven't been able to do that. And all of the uprising around Breonna Taylor, of course, happened as well after, um, after my book came out. And I imagine that, and also, and the camp and Charles Booker's campaign for Senate, which, um, which I was very supportive of. And, and, and he actually um, has a picture of himself with my book, which was really thrilling to me. Uh, um, you know, I am so looking forward to getting back to Louisville and seeing how the city has changed in the wake of the Breonna Taylor protests and what that has, I know that there at least are murals and um, uh, uh, that kind of public um, display that wasn't there last time I was able to be there. It's one of my favorite places in the world. So I'm anxious to be able to get <coughs> back and, and talk to um, everybody that um, I can when I get down there. So that's one of the things why I really want to get my vaccine. <laughs> able to, to go back to Louisville. Um, so I'm glad to hear that. The Braden story, of course, you know, Ann Braden is, and Carl Braden are kind, you know, kind of well known in the sense that people who know their civil rights history know them, but, you know, they should be household names like Sterling Neal should be a household name. And um, there's a lot of work to do on that in terms of the amazing accomplishments, but it's great to hear. It's, you know, it's wonderful for anyone who's involved in activism now to hear stories about how work that was done, you know, decades before, or even in the case, you know, my book is about how the 19th century activism of the Haymarket anarchist martyrs affected um, the work done in the 20th century by um, FE leaders. So to know that these things have ripple effects that are still felt um, and you know what Beverly talked about in terms of her family legacy and then people talking about what it means in terms of um, you know legacies within communities it's really important to know that. And so it gets frustrating and hard and, and, and um, discouraging at times. And that's one of the ways that history can be um, helpful is that it lets you know that, you know, that these things go in waves and everybody's um, work um, can be at least kind of felt later on, I think. Um, so. I think we're almost to the end, but there was one more question, right, Sarah? So there's a final question from Sam Smucker in the chat. And thank you so much for staying on past the hour with us, Tony. And um, so was there a history of interaction and solidarity between FE Louisville and UE locals in Evansville and Southern Indiana, especially during the initial organizing? Mm -hmm. I realized that the relationship between the two unions grew complex after HUAC and mergers, but I'm wondering about the time before that. Yeah, and um, and first of all, because I know people are dropping off the call because they have to, I understand it's been a while. Let me thank everyone for being here. It was wonderful. Thanks especially to Beverly and Kay and to John for sort of adding your personal, and Ira for adding your personal um, knowledge and expertise to this because that was really valuable and wonderful. And I look forward to seeing you all down in Louisville when I can. Um, but thanks everybody for being here because it was it was it was great to have everyone and thanks again to to the Rights Haven Center for having me. So um, in turn, this is kind of similar to the question I think that John raised yesterday about the the conversations or the connections between the UAW local in um, in West Allis and it was a radical led local UAW local. You know how much contact was there between um, the FE and UE locals in Southern Indiana and there was actually an FE harvester plant in Indiana, in Richmond, Indiana, which is further north. Um, so the answer to that, I mean, I don't personally know um, of actual communication. I'm sure there was, but part of the problem, as I said yesterday, for the left was that they were increased, as they were increasingly besieged, um, they were increasingly isolated and had to focus you know, unfortunately, just on what was immediately around them. And so, you know, part of what happens for the Louisville local, for example, is after this really difficult and consequential 1952 strike in which most of the people that I mentioned are fired and lose their jobs and not, um, you know, and therefore obviously not part of the local leadership anymore. 
the union itself, even as part of the FE, at least according to Jim Wright and some others, you know, starts to slip backwards. A lot of the leaders who, a lot of the people who get elected within the local don't have this same commitment to anti-racism. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, International Harvester is chalking up accolades and awards for its non-discriminatory hiring. It's getting um, recognized by the Urban League, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's this kind of, you know, perception of Harvester as a leader on equality while it's getting rid of those people in its own workforce who were really the warriors against racism. And so you have to like look and see what, um, what that meant. Um, but as those, as those fights get more and more intense, I think the unfortunate thing for these left unions and, and within them the left locals is they're focusing only on what's happening right around them, focusing on trying to keep their own members focus on trying to, you know, to, to get their strike fund um, 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 solvent, um, trying to get the worker that got fired for being a union activist, his job back. And so all those connections that could have sustained them that were more far reaching, just kind of start to, to dry up in another utterly different direction, which is something I also love about this union. They were the first and only union for a long time to have a farm relations director who is this radical rancher from South Dakota who had been involved in farmer labor activities for um, going back to the 1920s. And so one of their objectives, the FE's objectives was to try to promote those, the thing that I talk about during the 47 um, strike was to try to promote these contacts between smaller farmers and industrial workers. Um, but again, that kind of just completely after Taft-Hartley and after um, as the Cold War just really heats up that kind of that kind of work, um, they just didn't have the resources to continue, alas. They continue to have their farm relations director um, after Taft-Hartley for a while, but just don't, they don't have the, the ability to do that kind of work on any kind of big scale. So I guess long answer to Sam's question, but I don't have a good answer directly to those connections. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This was a really rich and stimulating discussion and outside of the academic norm, which is very much welcome. So uh, we hope that we will see you again uh, next Thursday for our conversation with Kim Stanley Robinson. And in the interim, thank you so much, Tony. This has been such a pleasure to have you with us this week. We just wish it could have been in person, but hopefully we can host you in Madison sometime in the future. So um, again, if, if everyone could give a virtual round of applause for Tony uh, to say uh, again, as I did yesterday, that Haymarket is having one of their famous sales. It's a fabulous book. So we highly recommend uh, going to Haymarket's website and purchasing The Long Deep Grudge. So thank you again, Tony. Really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who was here and um, to Kay and Beverly and Ira. I hope to see you in Louisville. Not too long from now. Thanks, everybody.